We are nearing the conclusion of a series we are calling, Who Am I? And the idea is that we will answer that question using God's Word, not the many voices that are out there in the world telling us who we are, who we should be, the pressure we feel even from within to be someone that God never created us to be. And it's so important that as we shape our identity, that we allow God to do that. Because it is so easy to live a lie, to have a case of mistaken identity. And so every one of these messages in this series, they were meant to be stacked upon each other, to sort of build this sense of identity that we have. And I hope that you will consider everything that we have said throughout this series, more than that, that you will consider what God has said about who you are, and that you will begin to build your life or rebuild your life around the identity that God has for you in Christ. But of course, before we can build, we have to do something else. You know, these TV shows where they go in there and renovate the houses, there's always that one day that they have to do what? Demo day, right? You got to demolish everything and, and clean it all out and tear it all up before you can start building again, before you can start renovating. And sometimes we need to do that in our own lives. And so in every one of these messages, we've been doing something like that. We've been declaring that we are not certain things. We're not buying into the lies of the world. And so I hope that you feel that way, that you're not what the world says about you. And so if so, then repeat after me as we have in every one of these messages, I am not what I have. I am not what I do. I am not what other people say about me. And I hope that you own those statements. I hope that that's exactly how you feel because when we live our lives, sometimes we get confused and we begin to think that our possessions define us, that our jobs and careers, that our abilities and accomplishments, that those things define us or that people can define us. And that is absolutely not true. We are not what we have. We're not what we, what we do and we're not what other people say about us. So a few days ago, I got a text from Mark Jernigan with this picture. I don't know if you can read it. <laughs> His son Cameron took this picture downtown right outside the Devon Tower. And it says on this, I guess, granite block or bench, it says, we are what we do. <laughs> Goes against everything we've been saying in this series. So I just texted back to Mark, ha ha, pagans, explanation point. <laughs> I really did. So if you work for Devon, I'm sorry. I'm sure there's good people there. I'm sure you're a good person. <laughs> That's not helping our sermon series at all. I'm sure that is some kind of internal slogan and trying to define who people and employees are and the work's so important, and, and that's great. But I think it is a reminder, isn't it? It's a reminder that the message of the world is you are defined by what you do. You're defined by how you look. You're defined by what you can accomplish. You're defined by the initials after your name. That's what our world seems to think, and it's easy for us to believe the same thing. But that is not true. God says, I created you. I know who you are. I know what gives you value and meaning and purpose, and it's not the things of the world. Do we find some level of identity in what we do as a job or what we accomplish, uh, even within the home and family? Absolutely. That is not our primary influencer of identity. And so today we look at one other aspect of who we are. And we're going to really focus in on one text this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. If you have a Bible, open it up or turn it on and go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me ask you, when do you feel weak? When do you feel weak? I can tell you when I feel weak. 
when I try to wrestle my son now. That's when I feel weak. That's why I don't do it anymore. Stopped that about five, six, seven years ago. When do you feel weak? Maybe when you're at the gym and you go to one of those weight machines and the person right before you had the pin on the very lowest plate, right? And you're like, okay, i got to move that thing up. Take that pin out and you put it up high, right? But you're trying to tone anyway. You don't want to bulk up. You're just trying to tone. So. But even beyond physical weakness, when do you feel weak? Maybe when your life just seems to be overwhelmed with stuff to do and places to go and meetings and appointments and you got to get the kids there and you got all this stuff and you just feel sort of inadequate for the job. Boy, sometimes I think about our single parents and I just, sometimes I just don't imagine how you get things done, how you do it all. And so maybe it's one of those times when you feel a little bit weak or not, not up to par with enough strength to just get through the day and get everything done. Maybe it's when you face a certain temptation, and that temptation just seems to just always be right there on your doorstep. And it's not just waiting patiently on your doorstep. It is knocking down your door. It's always there, and you battle, and you battle, and you try to find strength, and you try to find this sense of, of grit within you, but you continue to lose that battle, and you feel weak. Maybe it's when you look around the world and you see some of the things like, like Glenn was saying. You see the, the violence and you see the evil in our world and you see just all the hatred and discord and you think, it shouldn't be that way, but what can I do? I, I can't change the world. I'm one person with no voice. And you just feel small and weak. Maybe there are other times. Maybe when you're struggling with health issues or, or you're getting a little bit older and you can't quite do the things you used to do or you are struggling to recover from surgery or maybe it's when someone comes after you and they attack you, attack your character or they threaten you and, and they treat you poorly and, and everything inside of you wants to stand up, and wants to be strong, wants to just push through and, and be okay but the truth is it hurts. And it gets to you. And maybe you feel inadequate and you feel weak. My guess is that probably every person here, truth be told, knows what it's like to feel weak. But the truth is also that we don't often admit it, do we? We don't often embrace our weaknesses. In fact, we typically try to cover them up. Because weakness and admitting weakness is perceived as a weakness in our society, isn't it? And so what we do is we manufacture strength, and we put up this thin veneer of power and influence and strength. But behind it, we often know we are just about to crumble apart. I want you to know there is someone in the Bible Many people in the Bible who feel this way, but one in particular who we look at as a spiritual giant, someone who wrote a big portion of the New Testament, one that we would hold up as this character of faith and strength, and yet he admitted that he was weak. More than that, he said, but I know where to find strength. And I think we should listen to what he says. And so let me set up our text just for a, a moment in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Christians in this very worldly city of Corinth are struggling with who they should listen to. There are all these people trying to influence them. We would call them false teachers. In fact, Scripture calls them false teachers. But maybe what they say sounds right or it appeals to some, some selfish desire within us as listeners and so they're struggling with who they should listen to paul calls them in the previous chapter chapter 11 verse 13 he says they are false apostles they are deceitful workers they are masquerading as apostles of christ and he says ultimately they will get what they deserve but it's one thing to call them out it's another thing to say okay, you should listen to me. Not just don't listen to them, but listen to me. And that's the challenge that Paul has. 
At the same time, what makes this challenge difficult is Paul is trying to do it in a way where he doesn't brag about himself. He doesn't say, I'm so much better than them. I'm so much wiser than them. He remains humble. And so how do you convince a group of people who are confused on whom they should listen to, not to listen to this group and to listen to you? And so what Paul does... Well, they are probably showing their spiritual resumes. Look at all these things that I have done. Paul says, you know what? Let me just tell you about some of the things I've been through. Let me tell you about the struggles. Let me tell you about how people have attacked me. Let me tell you about being shipwrecked and beaten and flogged and on the run and always threatened. Why would I go through all of that if I wasn't the real deal? And there's a lot of credibility that is established in what Paul is saying. And so then as chapter 12 opens up, Paul sort of switches subjects, still in the same context of setting himself apart from these other false apostles, false teachers. And he goes on to visions and revelations. It is very likely that these false apostles are talking about all the different special visions they've had, the special things that they have seen. And so Paul says, well, let me, let me tell you something. So that's where we pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 12. I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. This is a little bit mysterious, isn't it? What's happening here, Paul? Paul says, I know a guy who was caught up or called up or sent up or lifted up to the third heaven. Kind of a funny way of saying it, isn't it? Is he really talking about someone else? Or is it one of those things where you ask something and then you say, I'm asking for a friend? You know what I'm talking about? When you're really talking about yourself? Most scholars think that's what Paul is doing here. It fits the context. But by saying it's someone else, he's deflecting praise from himself. He doesn't want to boost himself so much, and so he sort of does it in third person. That's very, very possible. Again, it fits the context. And he says, I know this man who was caught up in the third heaven 14 years ago. But he's not talked about it. He didn't brag about it. He didn't boast about it. Now, of course, Paul has had spiritual experiences, right? Even visions on the road to Damascus when he was converted. The bright light, the voice from heaven, the man from Macedonia, Acts chapter 16. Also the vision to go to Jerusalem, Galatians 2. And so Paul has had these special visions. But what's interesting is in all of these, God seemingly comes down to Paul. But in this one, this man is caught up to God in this third heaven. Now, Jews believed in a plurality of heavens, either seven or, in this case, three. And so the third heaven would be the highest heaven. And he even says that it's paradise, which was believed to be the place of the righteous dead. Beyond that, we really don't know much about what he means by third heaven. There are some extra-biblical accounts, Second Enoch, for example, that talks about Enoch being in the third heaven. But we don't know, obviously, a lot about that. The point is not about the details of the third heaven. The point is to establish Paul as a credible messenger. Why? So that they will listen to his message. That's the whole point. So now, as we continue we get to the application for today. But it all fits together. Verse 5. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore... In order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, 
a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Paul says, you want to see my resume? Right at the top, there's this huge thorn in my flesh. It's a messenger of Satan. Okay, Paul, what are you talking about? Wouldn't you like to know? Wouldn't you like to know exactly what Paul was talking about? And scholars have speculated, they have dissected and looked at and evaluated, and they say, well, clearly it's something physical. It's a physical ailment. After all, he says, thorn in his flesh. The word flesh there, it's physical. So maybe it's poor eyesight. Maybe it's malaria. Some people have said it's epilepsy. Maybe it's some kind of physical ailment, some condition that keeps cropping up that just seems to knock him down. Other people have said, no, it's probably more emotional. Maybe it's despair, it's depression. After all, look at all those things in chapter 11 he just talked about. All those things that's happened to him. Who wouldn't be discouraged, right? Others have said, no, it's a spiritual thorn. That it is this temptation that continues to show up. That he can't shake. That he can't overpower. It's a spiritual thorn. We just don't know what it was. And to be honest, that's probably best. Because all of us can relate to what Paul is saying. If it was more specific, we might say, well, I can't relate to that. Someone else maybe can, but I can't. But all of us know what it's like to have that messenger of Satan, don't we? That thorn in the flesh. And for Paul, it must have been serious. Because the text says, I prayed three times for God to remove it. Now, that could be literal. He prayed three times. Or it could be a way of saying, I prayed over and over and over again. In fact, the word is, I pleaded. Paul begged for God to remove this thorn. Maybe you know what that's like. Maybe you know what it's like to fall on your knees by your bed or in your closet or right where you are and beg God for something, to change your circumstances, to remove that you fill in the blank to change the diagnosis, to make the treatments work, to save the marriage, to help the person, to heal the person, to heal you. Maybe you know what that's like. Many of us do. And so this is the part of Paul's story where we read the next verse and we see God answers his prayer and God removes that thorn and Paul says, oh, thank you so much, God. And Paul goes on his merry way and God is to be praised as the one who answers prayer. Is that what happens? Now, this is where the story takes an unexpected turn, I think, but a very important turn, a turn that taps into our humanity Stripping away the easy answers and the spiritual cliches that so often adorn modern Christianity. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength makes a great t-shirt. But when I take it out of context, it doesn't mean much. And so often we do that. We have our cliches, we have our sayings, we have our words that we use to make ourselves feel better, to try to make other people feel better. But Paul says, I begged God to remove it. I pleaded with him. And notice what happens. In verse 8, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect and weakness. Wow. Here's a guy who is seemingly beamed up through the third heaven. Whatever that is. Obviously a spiritual experience that you or I probably won't have in this life. And yet he was unable to escape this tormenting thorn in his flesh. So what does he do? Does he say, God, you owe this to me. Do you know how much I've done for you? God, did you read chapter 11? Shipwrecked, beaten, flogged. You remember all that? You owe this to me. It's only right that you answer this prayer. God, you've answered other people's prayers. You've, remo- you've removed other people's thorns. God, why won't you remove mine? Does Paul let it stop him? 
Does he let it cause so much doubt that he just throws in the towel and gives up? Does he say, I've had enough? Does he let it destroy him? Does he let it silence his witness to the world or ruin his faith? No. Notice what Paul does. Paul lets his thorn give him perspective. He lets his thorn in the flesh open his eyes so that he can see not just himself and his circumstances more clearly, so that he can see God. Verse 9, Therefore, because God said this, because God answered my prayer that way, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties. For when I am weak, that's when I'm strong. Paul, wait a second. That doesn't make any sense. But instead of slowing him down or knocking him out, Paul's thorn delivered him from spiritual pride and caused him to lean into the strength of God. Paul found strength in his own weakness. And the world hears that message and they don't get it. They say that doesn't make sense. But it makes all the sense in the world in God's kingdom. You see, what you need to know, what you need to know is what you said at the beginning of this service, if you participated. And that is that you are strong. You are strong. Don't let anyone tell you differently. Don't listen to anyone who says you are weak. Because your strength is not found in your physical ability. It's not found in your financial influence, your social standing, or your grade A, gold star grit and determination that is within you. Real strength comes only from God. And it's found only when you acknowledge your weaknesses. It's one of the great mysteries of life in God's kingdom. Paul reveals this paradoxical, mysterious, otherworldly nature of life in the kingdom of God when he chooses to boast in his limitations rather than play the one-up game. Because Paul could have done that. But he chooses this moment to say, the only strength I have, the only credibility I have, the only power, the only influence I have comes from God. And I only see it when I realize that I am weak. Ernest Best said this, weakness belongs to the human condition. In other words, just the nature of being human. We have weakness. Even to the saved human condition. Even for Christians, right? And when accepted permits God's grace to operate. That's exactly what Paul is saying here about his own life. You see, when I rely on my own strength, what do I do? I, ten- I have a tendency to look away from God because I can do this. I just pull myself up by my bootstraps and I'll just persevere and I'll show determination and everyone will look at me and say, boy, that person is strong and I kind of like that, right? Makes me feel good about myself. But when I rely on my strength, on my talents, on my abilities, on my intellect, on my accomplishments, on my strength, then I don't need God's. But when I begin to acknowledge and own my own weakness, my own struggles, then and only then can I lean into the strength of God and be empowered by God to face temptation, to endure hardship, to get through difficulty. Many of you know the story of Rosa Parks. On December 1st, 1955, she changed our nation, and I'm grateful she did. She wrote a book called Quiet Strength. Isn't that a great title? Quiet Strength. That's exactly what Paul is saying here. This paradoxical kind of power, quiet strength. And here's what she says in this book, reflecting on the day that she did not give up her seat for a white person to sit down, which sparked a wonderful revolution 
that in many ways still is and needs to go on in our country. She said this, When I sat down on the bus that day, I had no idea history was being made. I was only thinking of getting home. But I had made up my mind, after so many years of being a victim of of mistreatment, not giving up my seat, and whatever I had to face afterwards, it wasn't important. I did not feel any fear sitting there. I felt the Lord would give me the strength to endure whatever I had to face. It was time for someone to stand up, she wrote, or in my case, to sit down. So I refused to move. Maybe as you reflect on your life, it is time for you to stand up in the strength of God, which may mean sitting down in your own weakness, or even more than that, falling to your knees in humble submission to God. Maybe it's time to stop relying on your strength, stop talking about your strength, stop drawing attention to your strength and your power and your influence, and start deflecting that to the one who truly empowers us. You see, there is an inverse relationship between human strength and God's power, right? The more I speak of and rely on my power, the less I acknowledge God's power. But the more I acknowledge and embrace and claim and own my weakness... In faith, the more I can look to and rely on God's strength and his power. Well, it sounds good as we say it in this air-conditioned church building, right? But the realization of this truth in our lives isn't always so easy to take. It's not always just bubble-wrapped in a nice package waiting for us on the doorstep or in the church assembly. You see, this truth, this eternal truth, usually comes crashing down into our lives, wreaking havoc on our lives. Paul says, I begged God to remove the thorn. He was in anguish. He says, it tormented me. But here's the thing. And this is hard for people to hear. And this is why so many people are drawn to Christianity, but when they see authentic Christianity, cross-bearing Christianity, they say, well, I, I don't know, that may be too much for me. The thing is, God cares more about a faithful life than he does a good life, a happy life. You see, we focus on wealth and health. Those are two very, very high values in our lives, aren't they? In our society, in our families, we focus on wealth and health. Our conversations surround themselves around wealth and health. Our pursuits, our investments of our resources are about wealth and health. I get it. But to God, those things are secondary, maybe even lower than that. God cares more about your faithfulness than your wealth or health. I know that's not easy to hear. And God, again, doesn't always answer the prayer like he answered Paul's prayer. Sometimes he does remove the thorn, and we praise God, don't we? But we also praise God when he says, my grace is sufficient for you. You see, sometimes... We only get to a place of real faith when our wealth or our health is threatened. And then we lean on God. And so let me encourage you to let your thorns point you to God. Like Paul, let the thorns in your flesh, whatever they are, give you perspective. Drive you to the throne room of God. Not just to ask him to remove it. That's fine. We all do that. You should. And I hope he does. But also, drive you to the throne room of heaven. Not just to ask that God would remove it, but to be faithful to God, even if he doesn't. To embrace and engulf yourself in that grace 
that he pours out on you and says, it's enough. It's sufficient. You have what you need. Yeah, but it won't lead to my wealth or health. And God says, that's not what I'm talking about. You have what you need for a life of faithfulness. Don't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Fall down on your knees and find God. That's where real strength is found. And it can be yours. Strength to face trials. Strength to endure temptation. Strength to overcome evil. To persevere through suffering. Strength to stand and to accomplish and to witness to this world. You are strong. And so, if you believe it, say it again with me, and this time we'll add a statement. I am not what I have. I am not what I do. I am not what other people say about me. I am strong. You are strong. Because God's strength is at work in you. But it begins with reaching out. It begins with acknowledging your weakness. So maybe today you need to do that. And I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe it means spending time in prayer. Maybe it means making some changes. Maybe it means confessing. Maybe it means restoring a relationship. Maybe it means something else. But if it involves us as a caring church family, please let us be involved. If it means we can pray for you, if you need to confess sin publicly, if you need to ask for encouragement, or if you want to celebrate what God is doing in your life, let us do that with you. Or maybe today you're ready, like so many people this past week, you're ready to give your life to Christ, to be baptized into Christ. We would certainly be happy to receive you this morning. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing. We'll have a couple of shepherds and their wives in the parlor right behind me. You can make your way out any of these doors or you can go out these doors up here and, and they would be happy to, uh, to shepherd you in there and to pray for you. Or you can come down to the front and we would be happy to do the same thing in this room today. If we can